Hi. <laughs> now I oh. see you. <laughs> I have this blog called uh, Come Backstage, so thank you very much for, for taking your time for answering my questions. You're and, welcome. Um, yeah, let's maybe start right away. Maybe you can tell me a bit of the current uh, lineup of LA Guns. Uh, how did you guys get together? Um, how can I imagine the creativity flows to get this, this great sound of LA Guns? Okay, yeah, when you're ready, I'm all set. <laughs> Let's go. Well, I tell you what, we um, Kelly Nichols rejoined the band, and uh, we did a show in 2019 at the May uh, in May at the uh, M3 Festival here in uh, Maryland, the big festival, and that was our first show that we did with this new lineup. It includes Scott Griffin, and Scott Griffin is uh, the lead guitar player in the band. He had been playing bass in the band while Kelly was out. And uh, it was just because he's a multi-instrumentalist and he took the gig because we were working and recording. And uh, when we started playing, me and Kelly we started playing again together, we asked Scotty to go back to his original uh, uh, instrument, guitar, lead guitar. And it was a great decision because he's such a great guitar player. And uh, a friend told us about a friend of mine in Las Vegas told me about Kurt Froelich. Mm -hmm. And Kurt is one of those musicians, there's millions of them all over the globe that slipped through the cracks and never really could get a chance. And we checked him out and uh, he was the first guy we checked out. And so we didn't have to go through a long audition process. And uh, so it came together really, the chemistry was great right away. We put on a great show at M3 and things really went quick after that. A big management company, New Breed here in LA, they signed us right away. They brought us to Golden Robot Records. And that late summer 2019, we started working on the album and everything came together very easily. You released it two days ago, uh, Renegade. And how, how long have you been working on it basically? And how can I imagine like this whole studio work now with this COVID times or was it before already? It was before it, but we all live all over the country. I'm in Los Angeles, Kelly's in New York, Kurt's in Florida and Scotty's in Las Vegas. <laughs> oh my God. So, I know, we're all over the place. <laughs> and so what happened was, it was the first time I did something like this. We did a two month internet exchange of songs. Wow. And all four of us are songwriters. So we exchanged about 40 songs and uh, we did that for about two months before we decided to pick 10 of those songs that we thought would work together on this album really well. And uh, once we finished that, we were, we, I had the guys fly out to LA. We did two days of like almost morning to evening pre-production to just put together what we had already been working on on the internet and then right into the studio for seven days to record. And um, we were toying around with the idea of doing it in 2020 and thank God we did because it would have been impossible to do it this year. <laughs> yes. so we went, yeah, we went right into the studio, seven days of recording and then I sent the guys home, they flew home and I mixed it with the engineer for about seven, five to six days, we mastered it. And it came together like a real old school record. We did it really fast. And I'm glad we did because we caught something really raw and we didn't dwell on it for a long time and, and wonder if we should change things and go back and work on things. We just caught a really good organic live form formula. And um, we were done by the end of 2019 with the whole record. And we just made it before all of this COVID thing set in. Thank God. <laughs> oh, I know. We were lucky. That was timing. <laughs> oh, my God. Big time. But um, if you had to describe it, what could the fans expect from it? Um, is it like this rough, classic LA Guns, uh, you would say? I would say because Kelly and I are classic members, we, we made a conscientious decision to not stray away too far away from the LA Guns sound. We wanted, we wanted to stay true to our sound because we're proud of our sound. We have a formula and the, the, the fans know 
what we do and how we sound. So we're co-writers on all of the old material. Kelly wrote Ballad of Jane, and uh, we, we co-wrote all of the early material with the other classic members. So we really wanted to stay true to that sound. But LA Guns has always had albums that have mixed it up. We've gone, it, it's gone from one style to another in the albums. And uh, you'll notice on the first three or four albums that we did in the 80s, it kind of moves around. And that's what this album does. I think we kind of captured that. And um, let's maybe talk a bit about the, the songs, actually. So um, maybe you can tell me something about the story behind the lyrics of Lost Boys. Lost Boys is a song that Scotty Griffin brought in. Mm -hmm. And he's been sitting on it. Actually, all of us have been sitting on a lot of this material for a few years now. We've written it, and it just didn't get recorded for any number of reasons. And Scotty Griffin brought this song in, and the music and the arrangement was close to being done. We finished in the studio, and then Kurt Follick brought it to, uh, back to his hotel, and he worked on the lyrics and the melody. And it's a story about, you know, a disenfranchised a youth and how it was a tough coming up on his own and uh, kind of sheltered and just really tough finding friends, tough fi finding a groove to fit in in life. And uh, it's kind of a dark lyric, but it's kind of an everyday lyric too. I think a lot of people uh, yeah. have go through that too. And it's one of my favorite tracks on the album, I love it. Yeah, me too. It's a really, really good one. But yes. I also, I'm a lot into uh, You Can't Walk Away. Maybe you can also tell me a little bit about that one. Yeah, that's a song that I brought in. I had written it a long time ago too. I've been sitting on it and I think I brought it into other albums that we were going to do. And another, for some reason, it just didn't land on one of the albums. I'm kind of glad too, because it was uh, pretty much done. When we gave it to Kurt, he tooled around with the chorus on it. And he stretched the chorus and added some pieces to it. And uh, it, it's another song about, you know, a hard breakup between a guy and a girl and, uh, and how it, it, it's probably matches up to a lot of people in life too, on how hard it is to break up with somebody and how hard it is to admit that maybe something is over and maybe you should move on in life. It could also take, place in a band too, you know, on yep. how if you, if you don't want to be in a band anymore, or if the band doesn't want you in there anymore, <laughs> then you, you know, you should find your way on. And uh, I, I love the way it came out. I love how Kurt finished it with his chorus. And uh, it's a song I've been, I've had for years. I've had it Amazing. for so long. It's really lovely. Like that's really my, my favorite one on the record. I oh, right great. on. Thank you. <laughs> Um, but also, there is a song called All That You Are, and in, in my opinion, this is a song you need to play live, you need to have an audience in front of you and rocking, rocking out. Do you plan to, to go on tour as soon as it's possible, or at least doing a stream thing? What's your opinion on this? Yes, every, every, we had a full schedule. Our original plan was to release Renegades March of 2020, and then when the COVID set in, we realized we weren't going to be able to do any shows, that none of the shows were going to be canceled. They were just going to be postponed into mm -hmm. 2021. So we have a full schedule of shows that start in March 2021. We, me and Kelly, we do not want to do, we, for so many years, we were doing 200 to 250 shows a year, clubs, a lot of clubs, mm -hmm. and it's a very grueling schedule. And we don't want to do that anymore. We want to do festivals, fairs, casinos, and then the odd show, a club show that would go as a satellite show for one of those gigs. But we want to be on bills that have a lot of bands on them, that have good equipment, good PAs, and bigger crowds. So we plan on doing about maybe 40 to 50 shows instead of that 200 to 250 shows. It's so grueling. You go on so late at night at the clubs. You go on at 12.30 in the morning. 
The lodging is really terrible. The equipment that you have to use is really half-assed and it's not very good. And so we're gonna do about 40 to 50 shows in 2021. They start in March again. And so what we're gonna do is we released All That You Are as the single before the album last week. And we plan on doing, we're such a classic rock band that we have to do three quarters of our set of older material. The fans want to hear Never Enough, Ballad of Jane, Sex Action. They want to hear that stuff. And we're cool with that. We're proud of it. But maybe we could do four new songs off of the new album and All That You Are would be one of them. Definitely. Good, because they're totally worth it. I mean, I'm in love oh. with all the old songs too, but the new ones really kick some ass. Yeah, totally. totally. I agree. And uh, like you told me that you, you still live in L.A. Um, how is it? Do you still enjoy going to the Sunset Strip? I mean, you've spent probably half of your life there. Um, how is it? Yeah, my goodness. When I moved out here in 1977. And from 77 to, I would say, like the mid-90s, I was always up at the Strip, you know, hanging out and seeing all of my friends up there and going to the Rainbow and the Roxy and the Whiskey and hanging in that area and seeing everybody. And uh, I, I gotta tell you, it, it's changed a bit because the, I, I don't go up there a lot as much as I do, did. I would go to the Rainbow for dinner now once in a while, but I don't really go to the strip a lot. And it has really changed a lot too. I mean, that whole scene that was up there was crazy. I mean, in the 80s from like, well, really from 77 to 92, it was just jammed with people, jammed with bands, putting their flyers up and everybody hanging out and having a really good time. It was a really good community. And, uh, but I don't, I don't go up there as much as I did, but um, there's still a nice little thriving scene up there. It's pretty cool. I'm kind of sad that I missed the 80s over there oh. because I wasn't even born yet, but yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah that's, that's the tricky part of it, but yeah. I guess. It was insane and you, and you try to describe it and, and it, it's very hard to describe because it really was such a thriving scene and uh, LA, you know, has a big distinction over any other city in the US. There were scenes that were happening in New York at, at, at points in Detroit and even Seattle, but nothing lasted as long as Los Angeles. If that, that, that scene was from 82 to 92, it was 10 straight years. And I was kind of fortunate because I was part of, there was two waves of hard rock that came out of LA. There was the first wave with Motley, Wasp, Rat, Dawkin, Great White, It was that first scene, yeah. and I was in I, I was in Wasp, and so I got to partake in that first scene. And then when I was out of Wasp in '87, there was this whole new scene starting with Guns N' Roses, L.A. Guns, Faster Pussycat, Jet Boy. It was a whole new scene, and I and just good timing got me from the first wave right into the second wave. So I was really lucky. I got to do the whole ten years. <laughs> Saw it all. <laughs> Crazy, crazy. <laughs> and um, like, as you were talking, like you've been in the music industry basically since forever. What do you think is the main challenge nowadays as a musician? Because things have changed quite roughly. So what's oh, your opinion? It, yeah, the, the biggest thing is that the reason I came to Los Angeles from Boston was because I knew that you had to be here because this is where all the big machines were the management the record labels just everything was here the bands the band members so i knew i had to come to los angeles the biggest challenge now is is there is no big machine happening the bands have to do a lot of stuff on their own mm -hmm. you have to really dig in and you have to utilize the internet and so i that's the biggest challenge i feel bad for up and coming bands because mm -hmm. they don't have that luxury of tagging on to a big machine. Like when I joined Wasp, they were managed by the Iron Maiden people. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of connections. And so Maiden was with Capital now and then Wasp was with Capital. So that, that transition 
to go with the big machine is not there right now. So you have to really dig in. Almost, well, we have to dig in, even with Renegades, we have to utilize the internet and understand that we have to join in on that and not fight it. You, yeah. have, to, you have to realize that's where it's at right now and to utilize it as much as you can. And it, I guess it's a great tool, mm -hmm. but in the 80s, you just had so much support from big machines, the management record labels, the publicists, the, the, just the agencies, everything was really right there for you. And that's kind of like not there right now. It's like you have to go out and find people, piece together machines. And then, like I said, you have to join the party and get on the internet mm -hmm. and get your websites up. You know that Spotify, iTunes, Apple's, this is the way to go yeah. because you don't have you don't have record stores anymore. It's very difficult. And so I feel for the young fans. I, I, I know it's tough for them. If you should convince a young person to listen to rock music, which song would you show him or her and why? You know what? I I I think that, you know, I even though we're harder rock than the Beatles. I think that every young musician should discover the Beatles only because they were so uh, they were so transformative. They they were they could go from hard to mellow to acoustic yeah. to pop and to study how the Beatles were and how they wrote music and how they made it a compact song. They made it a song that was very Uh, you could understand their songs very well. Obviously, a lot of my influences are harder. I love the Beatles so much, but, you know, I love Led Zeppelin. I love Sabbath. I love Deep Purple. And I love the harder edge. And that's where my career kind of went. Yeah. But to understand the Beatles and listen to their songwriting, I would tell them to check that out and to study it because they nailed it. They could do something as hard as Helta Skelta and yeah. something as soft as Blackbird. And it, it, it was just, you could go from one end of the spectrum to the other with that band. And it's still so vital. I mean, it's, I just, I, I would tell them to listen to the Beatles and check out songwriting from that band because they nailed it. And all of us followed it. <laughs> I see. Yeah, you, you, you got it all there. But do you have one special song in mind? If it was the song you would need to show someone? Wow. You know what? I, 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 I got so many great songs that I love from so <laughs> many bands. But I tell you what, I think that, you know, because I come from a harder rock thing, I think I would tell them to check out Help the Scalper. I think that, that Beatles Help the Scalper song It hits all of the marks everywhere. It's yep. compact, it's heavy, it's dark, it's light, and it has just all the shades in it. I tell them to check that song out. Great. <laughs> and um, my last question. If uh, you could have kind of a fantasy dinner with three persons of your choice, it doesn't matter if alive, dead, fantasy, whatever, who sits at your table? Who would you invite? Well, I'll tell you what. I would love to have dinner with Paul McCartney, for sure. <laughs> And I would love to have Jimmy Page at that dinner, too. And so it would be Paul McCartney, Jimmy Page, and I would probably put in there, because of my drumming, probably Ginger Baker. I'd probably have those three guys together and just try to pull <laughs> out of their brains. How? How did you do this? Why did you do this, you know? <laughs> I, you know, we did four albums with Andy Johns, the great producer, and sadly he passed away two years ago, but he had worked with Zeppelin and all of the great bands, even Hendrix and Van Halen oh and a number of bands, and I just picked his brain, and that, my dinner with McCartney, Jimmy Page, and Ginger Baker, I would just pick their brain and ask them, <laughs> how did you do this? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cool. <laughs> So, Steve, thank you very, very much for your time again. Stay healthy, and the last words are yours. Oh, thank you. Listen, you know what? I know it's so hard for our fans and all fans to find out where they could find how to buy 
albums and how to get stuff and how to do it. If they ever want to know how to order an album or look at some fun videos or merchandise, to go to laguns.net or go to goldenrobotsrecords.com. And at laguns.net, they could find all our tour dates, when we're going to be playing, and just how to order the album and, and find out what me and Kelly Nichols are up to. And listen, I thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot to me, and I'm so glad you write the new album. I love it. It's really, really great, honestly. Oh, God, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. But I hope to see you in Germany and all the fans <laughs> over there, too. <laughs> see you, Steve. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, honey.